You're hiking the Point Reyes National Seashore, and you bump into a mountain lion. Stay calm. You need to show it that you're not scared. Shout loudly at the lion. Wave your arms. If that doesn't work, start throwing rocks, branches, or anything else you can get your hands on. Aim at the ground in front of the lion. Never throw anything directly at it. That will only make it angrier. If the lion is getting closer, protect your most vulnerable spots. It will aim for the neck and try to grab your arms. So tilt your head forward and protect your neck. And don't make sweeping arm movements. When the lion realizes that you're not an easy opponent, it will probably back off and run away. You're in Yellowstone. Here you have to come face to face with the grizzly bear. It's drinking water from a creek. A safe distance is 200 feet. The grizzly has spotted you. It stands on its hind legs and looks in your direction. Now it's about the height of an average basketball player and it weighs almost 800 pounds. So you don't stand a chance to win. You have to freeze in place. Grizzlies have poor eyesight, so it just might not see you. But then it starts walking in your direction. Don't turn your back to it and don't even try to run as fast as you can. It will chase you. You need to seem bigger than you really are. Wave your arms and spread your legs a little wider. Always talk and shout at the bear. It will understand that you're not a humble deer. Try to make a clanking sound of metal. If you have food with you, don't throw it at the bear. Just put it on the ground and keep backing away while facing the bear. If it starts running towards you, your only chance is to fall to the ground and freeze. Bears aren't scavengers, so if it thinks you're not alive, it'll just sniff you, shrug, and walk away. Now you go diving on the Florida coast. You have to protect yourself from the great white shark. Never wear shiny and blinging jewelry when swimming. It attracts sharks. And never swim at night. This is when they go out looking for food. Lots of splashing water can also attract this marine predator. But if the shark swims towards you anyway, the rule here is one, do everything in your power to defeat it. Try to stay calm and swim to the shore. If the shark chooses you as food, there's only one thing that can scare it off. Try to punch the shark in the nose, eyes, or gills. Now you're in Africa. Here in the tall grass of the savanna, you see a lion, and worse, it sees you. The first thing you need to do is maintain eye contact. Don't turn your back to the lion and don't run. This eight-foot predator, weighing like three adults, is running at you at the speed of a car on the highway. But then it stops abruptly and continues to stare at you. Lions often make fake charges to frighten their opponent. At this point, you have to appear much bigger than you really are. Spread your arms and make loud noises. Then the lion can make another fake charge. And if you keep standing still, the lion will realize you're a strong opponent and go the other way. The female lion is way more dangerous than the male one. If it's guarding the babies, it won't stop and you won't stand a chance. Your safari jeep takes you to the next location. You see elephants peacefully drinking water. These guys can be 10 feet tall and weigh as much as two SUVs. They can even flip cars over with their powerful tusks. And now, one of them sees you and wags its big ears. It's bluffing. With those ears, the elephant wants to appear bigger and scare you away. It's also scared and won't run at you all the way. You must let the elephant know you're not threatening it. Don't yell or wave your arms. Take slow steps back until you leave the elephant's personal space. If it runs at you with ears to its head, it's not bluffing. Climbing a tree isn't a good option right now. It might ram the tree and you'll fall down. It might even tilt the tree with its strong trunk. You need to run in a zigzag pattern. The elephant is heavy and it's hard for it to change directions quickly. So gradually, you'll start to pull away from it. But still remember that an elephant can run 25 miles per hour, so you'll unlikely escape from it. Now let's move on to the Nile River. It has the largest number of crocodiles in the world. If you are camping, take a distance of at least 160 feet from the shore. This way, the crocodile will not stumble upon your camp at night. Never take your eyes off the crocodile. It can take advantage of that moment and take you by surprise. Their top speed is only 10 miles per hour, but they can make charges at 40 feet per second from the water. So the only chance to survive is to stay out of the water. If not, the crocodile's weak points are the eyes, the tip of the nose, and the membrane in the throat. This membrane prevents water from entering the crocodile's throat. When running away from a crocodile, be careful not to bump into a hippopotamus. This is one of the most dangerous animals in the world. They can be the size of a business class car and weigh as much as a big elephant. And they can run as fast as horses. So they're sure to outrun you in a sprint. The main thing is to not frighten it. If you're standing far away, get its attention with a loud sound. Usually they will try to get away from you. Use this moment to back away too. But if you see a hippo yawning, it's a sign that you're violating its comfort zone. They can open their mouth at 180 degrees and have the bite force of a crocodile. So you can't beat it and have to run. 
the best option is to climb a tree or some kind of slope. Hippos have a hard time climbing high places, and if you manage to escape, you'd be one of the few people who survived a face-to-face -face encounter with a hippo. There's also buffaloes living here in the savannah. They can be as tall as an adult and weigh a whole ton. And unlike lions and elephants, they don't make a fake charge. If you see this machine running at you, it definitely has evil intentions. Their powerful horns and skull can bend sheets of metal. They can turn a new car into a pile of scrap metal. You can never outrun a buffalo, so your only option is to find the nearest tree and run to it before the buffalo even starts its charge. If you run into a snake, you need to freeze in place. There are endless species of snake, and you don't know if your opponent is venomous or not. So you definitely need to avoid getting bitten. Make smooth and slow backward movements. If the snake is following you, stop and start stomping your feet. The strong vibrations of the ground should scare it away. If the snake bit you anyway, try to remember exactly what it looked like. Better yet, take a picture of it. To neutralize the venom, you need to take an antidote to the specific venom of that species of snake. You're on your way to Northeast Asia. As you're going through the dense jungle, you see a clearing. Several wild boars are peacefully grazing there. One of them is a female with several children. It'll do anything to protect them, so it's especially aggressive now. Oops, it spotted you. Get ready to defend yourself. If the wild boar is making high-pitched, piercing cries, it's going to strike you. The first thing you need to do is to stay calm and stand still. You have a good chance that the boar will go on its way, but you see it starting to run. And now you have several options. A, you can run away. B, you can face the blow. And C, climb the nearest tree. The first option is wrong. Wild boars can run almost as fast as Usain Bolt, and when it catches up to you, its sharp tusks won't leave you a chance. Option B, stay where you are. Wrong, a wild boar can weigh as much as a motorcycle and be almost as long as an adult. A hit at 25 miles per hour will just knock you down. So the correct option is to climb the nearest tree. If there's no trees, then climb a car or a tall rock. You have to be in a higher position than the boar. When it realizes it can't reach you, it'll leave you alone. The most important thing is to stay away from wild boars. Never try to feed them or provoke them. This black, ominous-looking snake won't hurt you. It's got no fangs. You may have mistakenly thought that this black critter is none other than a black mamba. But it's just a harmless rat snake. There's one main sign that can help you figure out if a snake is really dangerous. Unfanged species do not have a venom delivery system. Therefore, their bites won't harm you that much. But if you see a snake with fangs, you're in real danger. If you come across a snake, it's best to leave the area and seek assistance from a wildlife professional in identifying the reptile. Here are some tips to help you distinguish between the two types. Observe their behavior, nesting habits, and habitats. Some snakes may shake their tails as a warning signal. Also, venomous snakes typically have triangular-shaped heads, compared to non-venomous snakes with rounded heads. Time for an optical illusion. Can you spot a snake here? You'd better be attentive because there's a boomslang hiding on that tree. This slithery critter has mastered the art of disguise, and it likes to pretend to be a tree branch. Also, Boomslangs may not have the best sense of smell, but they make up for it with their ability to detect chemicals in the air. Using their tongues, they gather odor molecules and press them against their sensory organs in the mouth. This snake is venomous. Just look at those fangs. Still, while they're not in use, the snake can neatly fold back its fangs into its mouth. Rattlesnakes and humans have something in common. Both have a lot of keratin-made accessories in our bodies. Human nails and hair are made of keratin, and rattlesnakes' rattles are made of it too. The staple sounds these slithery creatures make are similar to the noise we humans can make when we rub our nails against one another. But these reptiles do it super fast, so it almost sounds like hissing. Whenever the snakes shed, they add up a new segment to their rattle. But it's not like the older a snake is, the more segments it has. Their rattles may wear off or break, just like our nails. Rattlesnakes, as well as many other snakes, have a unique inner ear structure that doesn't include an eardrum. This means they can't pick up airborne sounds like we do. Instead, their inner ear is connected to their jaw, and they use this mechanism to feel vibrations. 
biologists are still figuring out whether snakes detect sounds through pressure or mechanical vibrations in their bodies. They're also quite selective eaters. Rattlesnakes only chow down when they're feeling hungry, with adults usually waiting around two weeks between meals. These sneaky hunters usually go after mice, rats, squirrels, and rabbits, but they won't say no to a bird if they manage to catch one. Younger rattlesnakes, on the other hand, tend to have a heartier appetite, sometimes dining as often as once a week. Now look at their huge fangs. They're like hypodermic needles, hollow and sharp, allowing them to inject venom. What's really cool is that these fangs are hinged and lie flat against the snake's upper jaw when its mouth is closed, only to spring forward perpendicularly when it strikes. Majestic cottonmouths are named this way because of the striking white coloration inside their mouths that they display when threatened. These semi-aquatic serpents effortlessly navigate both water and land, earning them the moniker Water Moccasin. Equipped with heat-sensing facial pits nestled between their eyes and nostrils, they possess an extraordinary ability to detect even the slightest temperature variations, honing in on potential prey with precision. Rarely do cottonmouths bite humans, reserving their venomous strike for moments of provocation. Here's a tip on how to distinguish between non-venomous water snakes and their venomous counterparts, cottonmouths. While water snakes boast a slender build, cottonmouths exude a robust and weighty presence. The telltale signs continue with water snakes sporting elongated, slender tails and heads proportionate to their necks, contrasting with the blocky and broad head of a cottonmouth. The pupils of the water snake are round, a departure from the vertical, cat-like pupils of cottonmouths. Plus, non-venomous snakes don't have the distinctive facial pits characteristic of pit vipers, like cottonmouths. Here's another venomous star, the copperhead snake. Their musk smells just like cucumbers. Their venom is pretty particular too. Will you be in trouble if this snake bites you? Totally. Does it help cure lethal conditions? Um, sorta. It's not a 100% proven fact so far, but scientists have been testing this theory for quite a while, and they did notice that the copperhead snake's venom can, if not cure some serious conditions, but slow down their progression. Even so, they have the most venomous bites among all the US snakes, but antivenom for the bites somehow is not always needed. Coral snakes are known for their non-aggressive nature, as they are shy and secretive creatures. Theirs make up less than 1% of snake bites in America. Their venom is a neurotoxin that paralyzes nerves, and due to their small teeth, they must chew on their prey to inject the venom. When feeling threatened, a coral snake will curl the tip of its tail to confuse the attacker about the location of its head. The mysterious and mesmerizing black mamba, also known as the black mouth mamba, calls the rocky savanna its home and loves to hang out near termite mounds. With a color range from gray to dark brown, its name comes from the dark interior of its mouth. Black mambas hold the title of some of the fastest moving snakes globally, reaching speeds of 10 to 12 miles per hour on a sleek surface. Despite its fierce reputation, unprovoked attacks on humans remain unproven, and the snake is actually responsible for only a small number of lethal cases each year. Saw-scaled vipers possess a fascinating ability to produce a spine-chilling noise, accompanied by a striking threat display. The unique shape of their scales allows them to create a prolonged rattling hiss or sizzle when they move in a particular terrifying manner. These sounds serve as a clear warning to anyone in close proximity to the snake. Despite being responsible for many fatalities, Without treatment, the saw-scaled viper's bites are fatal in fewer than 10% of cases. This contrasts starkly with the king cobra and black mamba, whose untreated bite fatalities are significantly higher. Saw-scaled vipers are known for their extreme aggression and lightning-fast strikes, making them some of the quickest and most unpredictable snakes in the world. When you're out hiking in the bush, Remember not to mess with any snakes you come across, even if they don't seem alive. Some sneaky snakes play possum and can strike if bothered. 
If you spot one, give it some space. When it comes to snakes, they're usually pretty shy and won't bother you unless they feel threatened. Trying to catch or harm a snake is a big no-no, as that's when most snake bites occur. And don't be tricked by their size. Even little snakes can pack a punch. For example, baby brown snakes are born with venom, so it's best to admire them from a safe distance. Each year, over 7,000 Americans fall victim to snake bites, often due to misguided attempts to handle or fight a snake. It's crucial to avoid such actions and seek immediately medical help if bitten. Understanding how to differentiate between venomous and non-venomous snakes is key to assessing potential risks. Contact a professional if you're unsure about a snake's identity and never handle a snake, even if it appears harmless. You're driving around with your friend Annie in the wild Australian outback. The sun is scorching hot, but you see a mob of cute kangaroos hopping around. You stop the car and you get out to film them with your friends. You even go live to impress your friends and followers. Suddenly, one of the kangaroos leaps towards you at full velocity, ready to swing. Alright, let's freeze right here for a second before you or your friend get hurt. Kangaroos have extremely powerful legs and can jump around 30 feet in the air. Those strong legs can let them hop at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, faster than any average human. So, if you're thinking of outrunning a mob of angry kangaroos or a single kangaroo, then don't. They'll chase after you and knock you down before you even reach your top speed. Their tails are strong and sometimes act like a fifth limb when they're grazing in a field. Kangaroos generally eat grass like cows, but also feast on shrubs, moss, and even fungi. Their tails are essential for keeping balance. They can stand as tall as 6 feet, with their tail making up half of that. Back to you guys. The kangaroo is only a few feet away from you. The first thing you have to do is protect your body. Turn it sideways and extend your arm out. Make sure your head is out of reach. Their paws have very sharp claws, so you don't want them laying any jabs on you, especially your head. They kick with both feet, which means they rest their body on their tails and extend both legs to push kick their aggressors, aka Annie and you. Their feet are huge, which makes them even more dangerous. Well, time is still frozen, so you and Annie get into position and are ready for the kangaroo attack. And action! The kangaroo stands face to face with you like a boxer in a ring. It moves closer, but you're in the correct position to reduce damage from your end as much as you can. Even though you know how to defend yourself, facing off with a 6-foot kangaroo isn't the best idea. The best you can do is slowly back away without startling it. Don't turn your back on it, you might get a surprise attack. If backing up doesn't help, let it know it's won this battle. Don't return any eye contact if you can. Cower yourself. You might have missed some warning signs while observing them from afar. The kangaroos weren't stomping their feet because they were excited to see you. They were telling you not to come any closer. When one of them hopped over to you, it stood high on its legs and flexed its muscles to show dominance. The biggest fail of all is that you pulled over while they were grazing peacefully. They thought of you as a threat and went into defensive mode. The mob has several joeys, or baby kangaroos, sticking their heads out of their mother's pouches. Female kangaroos have a pouch on their belly made of a fold of skin to house the babies. When they're first born, they're only the size of a grape, but then blossom to the giants that they are. Only after 10 months, joeys are old enough to move out of mom's pouch and hop on their own. So, you and Annie survived that confrontation for now. But what happens when you're face to face with a 40-foot kangaroo? I'm just kidding, we're keeping it real here. It would be super difficult to face off with a grizzly bear. The first thing you would need to know about grizzlies is that they're very cute when they're berry picking or just scratching their backs on tree bark. But their dark side is scarier than a kangaroo's. You're having a little picnic with Annie when suddenly a grizzly bear approaches after smelling some yummy food. Don't panic, we'll freeze time here to give you a chance to think about what to do. In general, the best way to survive a grizzly attack is to avoid it altogether. Grizzlies are wanderers always looking for the best spots to find some food. Their sense of smell is impeccable so its nose led the bear right to your picnic. The bear is very close to you. No need to panic. You should show the bear that you're just a visitor on its territory. Back away slowly while speaking in a low and calm tone. It needs to know that you're submitting to it. 
as it's the dominant creature in this encounter. There's a lot of tension when you're face to face with a bear, so don't turn your back and make a break for it. That will only let the bear chase you down, and you won't win in that race. They're faster than humans and can swim and climb trees, so unless you sprout some wings and fly away, do not try to outrun a grizzly bear. Next, you should avoid eye contact. Just like the cute and cuddly kangaroos, bears take it very seriously and watch your every move. They also consider direct eye contact as a sign of aggression, as if you want to challenge them. Grizzlies also like to play a game of chicken. They wait to see your moves and can even fake a charge to see how you're going to react. Either way, you have to stand your ground. If the bear lowers its head and protrudes its neck towards you, then it knows that it wants to charge right at you. Since we froze time for now, we can't know for sure what its next move is going to be. Let's jump back into action to see what it'll do. Because you'll have to plan your next move depending on the bear's move. And action! The grizzly bear isn't showing any signs of aggression so far. It's just curious about the setting. Remember your training. No eye contact. Okay, the bear is showing some signs of aggression now, which means it could potentially attack you. Stand your ground, it's getting closer. The best thing to do in this scenario is to completely submit to it by laying face down on the ground covering your head with your arms. Don't move. The bear might understand that you're submitting to it and walk away. Sometimes bears will stick around for a while before leaving you alone. Luckily, this bear only wanted the food from the picnic, so it grabs the sandwiches and runs away. You guys were lucky this time, but if the bear did attack you, you'd have to fight it off as much as you can. You can use any objects nearby to help you. It's best to aim for the most sensitive spots, like the bear's eyes and nose, with all your strength. What makes cougars stand out from other predators is that they're excellent stalkers. You're hiking in the forest, and you don't realize that you have an unwelcomed guest along with you. Cougars will stalk you if they think you're good to eat and can pounce from out of nowhere and if it knows it's the right time. These giant cats generally don't attack people, but who knows what's on their mind. The rule of thumb when face to face with a cougar is pretty much the same as with other animals. Stand your ground and don't run. Running will only trigger the cat, as it will outrun you for sure. These cats are strong and have very quick reflexes. Their claws are powerful and their bites are even worse. You don't want to be chased by one of these. Now that you're standing your ground, make yourself appear bigger than the cougar. That's right, raise your arms and puff out your chest. Always keep eye contact to try to assert dominance. You don't have to appear weaker or submissive to the cat, unlike when facing a grizzly or a kangaroo. On the contrary, you need to show that you're more powerful than it is. So don't cower down or break a sweat. It's watching your every move. The next steps really depend on the cougar. Let's resume, shall we? Okay, it's showing signs of aggressive behavior. It's a tough kitty, and it doesn't want to lose this game. If appearing tall doesn't do anything, then try waving your arms around and shout from the top of your lungs. If you can throw some rocks at it to scare it off, then it would be another plus for you. The kitty looks like it wants to attack. No matter what, stand your ground. After a while, the cougar submits and runs away. You won this encounter. Now just because you got away with this doesn't mean you're good in the future. If the cougar did attack you, then your only option would be to fight back. Find some objects nearby to help you, and don't give up. This is not some hypothetical situation or fairy tale. The Vesuvius supervolcano that erased the city of Pompeii may wake up again and destroy many other towns built near the mountain. And to understand what consequences humanity would face if it wakens this time, it's smart to know what the eruption did 2,000 years ago with the ancient city. So Pompeii was a thriving city in the Roman Empire, located just 5 miles from Vesuvius on the west coast of Italy. It was a resort where the noblest and richest people rested. They walked along cozy streets, lived in beautiful villas, and had fun beside fountains. The soil in this region was fertile since the ground around the volcano had a lot of useful elements. Olives and grapes from Pompeii were sold throughout the empire. 
About 12,000 people lived in Pompeii by the time of the eruption. It seems not so much compared to modern standards, but it was considered a big city in those days. The catastrophe began unexpectedly in 79 CE. At first, everyone felt the ground tremble. Birds flew away from the volcano as far as possible. There was tension in the air because of the impending catastrophe. The volcano started to release thick smoke, soot, and ash. There was so much of it that soon it obscured the sky over the city with a heavy gray cloud. Vesuvius spat out gases, rocks, and dirt. Hot ash polluted the air and made it difficult for people to breathe. Locals couldn't see inside this gray haze. And then it started raining heavily. The water mixed with ash and soot and fell on Pompeii. Roofs of houses broke under the heavy weight of mud. Streets, fountains, alleys, and squares were hidden under millions of tons of soot. The next day, the destruction continued with renewed force. There was an explosion of hot gas and crushed rock at the top of the mountain. A devastating blast wave at a speed of 100 miles per hour dispersed in all directions and vaporized all the trees in its path. When the wave reached Pompeii, it turned the city into ruins. On the second day, the eruption stopped. By this time, the great town had been lying under a thick blanket of ash. By the way, this type of eruption is called an explosive one. But when lava flows out of a volcano and causes a fire, this is a quiet eruption. The last time Vesuvius erupted was in 1944. But even today, it's still one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. But nobody's afraid of it. Three million people live around the mountain, about 20 miles from the crater. If the volcano wakes up, it could be one of the most enormous cataclysms in the modern world. Pompeii was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. Since then, science and technology have advanced a lot. We're planning to colonize Mars someday. We've created a metaverse, but so far, we're still powerless before the forces of nature. An erupting supervolcano can destroy nature around it and cause technogenic catastrophes in big cities. The phone lines would be overloaded and people wouldn't be able to call their loved ones or the rescue services. There would be big traffic jams on the roads. Panic would spread throughout the streets. Fires would start because of falling hot soot. All flights would be canceled, and locals would have to hide in airports, supermarkets, and the subway. A large gray cloud would obscure the sun and make the air hot. The only thing that can help us in such a situation is a preliminary warning about the upcoming eruption and good preparation. So if the disaster starts while walking on the streets, you should take shelter in a car or building. It's better to buy a dust mask in advance that allows you to breathe freely. If there's no mask, cover your nose and mouth with any cloth. If you stay at home, close all doors and windows so volcanic ash can't get into your apartment or home. These incandescent particles can easily set fire to a carpet or curtains. Put wet towels under the door sills. If you need to go outside for some reason, wear a suit covering your body completely. Don't forget about the protection for your eyes. Put on special glasses that have a dustproof function. And remember about the mask. If you have a house, you need to disconnect the downpipes from the gutters to avoid clogging the drains. If your house has a rainwater collection system, you need to disconnect the pipes from the tank. Rain with ashes is a hot, dense mess that can easily break the water supply system. Fill the tub and sink to have water for washing and cleaning in case the central water supply is turned off. Set the lowest temperature on the fridge and freezer. Your food will be stored much longer if electricity is shut down in the city. Go to a room without windows above ground level and wait for a message from authorities on the radio or TV. Keep the receiver close to you so you don't miss anything important. The device must have a full charge, a strong body, and a powerful antenna. Here's an excellent option for survival in the ash apocalypse. The eruption is intensifying. 
and you hear on the radio about the evacuation. At this point, you need to calm down and follow the instructions from rescuers. Collect a bag at home with food, water, and medical supplies. Your emergency kit should include flares, maps, a first aid kit, sleeping bags, flashlights, a fire extinguisher, a portable phone charger, car tools, and a few charged batteries. You should always have a filled gasoline canister if you live near an active volcano. Going to the gas station is not a good idea during the evacuation. You can get into a long traffic jam and spend too much time in it. If you don't have a car, ask your friends for help or pay someone for a ride. It's possible the city administration would organize buses for evacuation. You would find out about it through the radio. In any case, before leaving the house, don't forget to turn off the gas and electrical devices and shut off the valve with the water supply to prevent your home from a gas leak or flooding. Government officials. So, you're driving a car. The authorities must announce the plans for evacuation. Don't go off the route because some roads can be blocked. Perhaps they will say the eruption is over and you can return home. Maybe the eruption will be so strong that it will destroy the city. Anyway, if you're prepared, you'll have fewer things to worry about. Modern seismic sensors monitor the fluctuations of tectonic plates and the volcano's activity, so the eruption won't be a surprise. Pompeii is far from the only city destroyed by the eruption. In 1785, a similar disaster occurred in the Japanese town of Aogashima. It was located right in the crater of an active volcano, and one day it woke up. It was sunny weather, and no one suspected a disaster was coming. At some point, the birds rose in the air and flew away. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from the depths of the island, and thick streams of smoke and ash erupted from the volcano. The volcano threw dirt and big red-hot stones into the sky. It looked like a meteor shower. People evacuated, and the mountain continued to erupt for several weeks. When the ashes settled, the volcano fell asleep again, and people began to return to their city. Despite the risk of a new eruption, they continue to live and work there today. Since then, more than 200 years have passed, and the volcano never woke up. Meteorological and seismological services monitor the situation and seismic activity. After all the horrors and devastation that a volcanic eruption leads to, harmony in nature eventually comes. Decades and centuries later, volcanic ash, rich in helpful food elements, settles on the soil and makes it fertile. Then life will rise from the ashes like a phoenix. Welcome back to Science and You. As you're walking in the wild, a snake appears from some dry bushes and bites you above your ankle. How rather unfortunate. Keep calm. You must keep your heart rate and blood pressure low to slow down the spread of the venom. Remove your shoes and socks. Now you must find out whether the bite came from a venomous or non-venomous snake. If you see two deep puncture wounds on your leg, they came from the venomous fellow's fangs. In a non-venomous serpent's bite, you'll see small sharp teeth in a U-shape. There are around 600 venomous snake species, and you should look out for vipers and cobras. Each has a different type of venom and needs different treatments. If a viper bites you, don't put pressure on your wound. Trapping the venom in one area could make the tissue damage worse. Then you must rush to the nearest hospital for treatment. If a cobra bites someone, you must tie the area with a bandage to stop the venom from going further into their system. Keep an eye on the fellow that was bitten to make sure they're breathing. Yes, cobra venom can paralyze the diaphragm. Don't suck out the venom. It travels so fast into someone's system, you'll achieve nothing. Take a good look at the snake, and if you can, snap a few photos of it to show the medical staff. Try to have good picture composition. Moving on from snakes to allergies. 
Most people respond to allergens with a runny nose or some sneezing, but others have far more complicated responses. An itchy rash may be a sign of an allergic reaction. It might look like dermatitis, and it can show up a week after your exposure to an allergen. There was a rare case a few years ago. Someone got braces for the first time, and after a week, they developed an itchy rash under their wristwatch and stomach. As it turned out, they were allergic to the nickel in braces. If you get blisters on your skin after sitting in the sun for one to two hours, it's probably not sunburn, but an allergic reaction. You may also have some skin redness, tiny raised bumps, and scaling. When that happens, go to the emergency room fast. Experts will run tests and give you advice on how to continue from there. Sometimes different medications might cause it too, or fruits such as limes and parsnips can. If you're allergic to pollen, stay away from fruits and veggies. Some of them have proteins like the ones found in pollen, and your immune system responds to it as real pollen. They can trigger the same allergy symptoms such as itchiness, swelling of the mouth, face, and, well, you know the gist. You're trapped in a car during a winter storm. Outside it's freezing, and you begin to shiver. That's a good thing. When temperatures drop below a comfortable level, your body starts to shake. This action boosts your body's surface heat production by 500%. But shivering can only warm you up for so long. After a while, your muscles will run out of fuel and they'll stop contracting. If someone suddenly stops shaking and they grow tired and want to fall asleep, act fast. Bring them indoors, remove any wet clothes, rub their hands and feet, wrap them in blankets, and find warm, dry compresses to apply to their chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never put a warm compress on their arms or legs. The sudden heat will force cold blood back to the heart, brains, and lungs, causing the body's core temperature to drop. While you're driving down an empty road, you hear an emergency radio broadcast about the weather. A tornado watch in your area means that a tornado is likely to happen. But a tornado warning means a tornado has appeared on the radar or has been spotted in person. You should also be on the lookout for hail. It appears when updrafts within a thunderstorm push the rain into the thick clouds and it freezes. But when a tornado is approaching, hail can arrive without rain. Then everything gets quiet. The air becomes still and there's no wind. Suddenly, you'll see the clouds moving quickly in a rotating pattern or toward the sky. You'll hear a loud waterfall sound that will turn into a roar as the tornado gets close. It'll be similar to the sound of trains and jets. Debris will begin to fall, and a funnel-shaped cloud will start to rotate, pulling branches and leaves upwards. If the tornado is not moving to either the left or the right, it might be coming toward you, and you won't realize it until it's too close. Take shelter! Just as you're chilling at home watching TV, you hear an eerie whooshing noise. It sounds like a soft gush of wind, but you confirm there's nothing there after checking all the doors. The next day, you feel pressure in your chest, and it gets worse as the week progresses. The chest pains follow with a dreaded feeling of exhaustion. You can't help but think there's something wrong with your body. But the problems are within your house. You might have carbon monoxide poisoning. When this gas fills your home, it builds up in your bloodstream and it replaces the oxygen in your body. Poisoning can also cause headaches, nausea, and confusion. In those cases, run outside to get fresh air and call emergency service. Also, get a carbon monoxide detector and add it in the hallway or areas where you sleep. Check the batteries twice a year, and when the alarm goes off, step outside and you know who to call. You go ice skating. The ice on the lake seems thicker than it was, and uh-oh, you hear a cracking snap, and you end up in the icy water. 
First, your body will go into shock because of the sudden change in temperature. Don't worry, it will pass after one to three minutes. Now, you must find a solid piece of ice and hold on to it. Don't try to climb it. Just put your arms on it, kick your legs, and push the piece forward. It will help you drag your body onto the ice. Once you're on an ice sheet, don't stand up. If you do, your body weight will concentrate on the smaller ice area and it'll break again. Just keep rolling until you're further on the stable ground. What if you have to break the window of a hot car? Car windows have layers of materials that can resist force. Here's what you need to do. Avoid the back windows or the front windshield of the car. They're harder to break. Go for the passenger and driver's side windows. If you've got a hammer, don't hit the glass in the middle. Aim for the edges, where the glass breaks easily. Now, if the windows refuse to break with a hammer, screwdriver, or whatever you've got around, look for a small, pointy rock. If that doesn't work either, then your best bet is your car's spark plug. Pop your hood, pull out the spark plug, break the porcelain casing, and throw the broken ceramic piece anywhere at the window. It's the middle of summer, and you're vacationing somewhere on the Pacific Rim. Suddenly, you feel a strong quake. Well, this could be the first warning sign of an approaching tsunami. Or it could trigger large waves thousands of miles across. But there are other telltale signs that a tsunami is approaching. One is a change in water levels, either rising or falling. If you see the ocean withdrawing quickly and the seabed getting exposed, you should run at least 100 feet above sea level and one mile inland. Many experts say once the seawater starts receding, you've got five minutes to evacuate before the enormous wave hits. Remember, it's all about science and you. On your way to the Caribbean, your plane breaks down and you fall directly into a dangerous rainforest. In order to survive until the rescue team arrives, you need to go through a series of tests to make it out of there. Great vacation, huh? You know you can't survive without water for too long, so your first task is to find a source of drinkable water. Near your camping site, there are a few options. There is a small pond, a stream, and a juicy cactus. Mm. What source of water do you think is the most reliable one? Most cacti are pretty toxic. And instead of quenching your thirst, they might give you a stomach ache. The pond isn't a good option. There are all kinds of bacteria swarming in it, so that's a no-go. The stream is your safest source of water. It's the freshest. It's been two hours since you crashed. Survivalists know that your next move needs to be finding a shelter to spend the night. You look around and you map three different options. You see a tall tree with a branch you could rest for the night. There's a pretty dark and damp cave that looks kind of scary. There's a clearing in the forest where you could create a bed with fallen leaves. Which one do you choose? There are lots of natural shelters in the wild. You should avoid tall trees since they can be struck by lightning. A clearing won't protect you from possible predators and bad weather. That's why a cave is always a good option, especially if you're in a cold area. Caves tend to keep a constant temperature, so it's a good place to spend the night. Over 10 hours have gone by and your stomach starts growling. You go for a walk to find some food and come across plants that you think might be edible. Mm. You just need to understand what's the best way to determine whether or not they are safe to eat. What should you do then? You could smell the plant and evaluate its color. You could rub the plant on your skin and wait for a reaction. Or you could take a small nibble of the plant and wait for any weird effects. What's your two cents in this scenario? Do 
Just smelling a plant and looking at its color is not going to be enough to determine whether they're poisonous. Rubbing it on your skin might help you with that part, but you need to go a step further. The best way to test if a plant is edible or not is to take a small nibble and wait for any adverse effects. Of course, this option is already risky, but if your stomach is growling and you have nothing else to eat, I'd say go for it. At the end of your second day in the wild, you start to hear some noises in the woods. It sounds like there are some felines around. What is your best option to keep safe in this case? You could climb the tallest tree and wait until you don't hear anything else. You could stand your ground and start a fire. Or you could spend the night roaming around so they won't find you. If you decide to roam around at night, that might be it for you. Although most wild cats are not inherently dangerous, they do have a hunting instinct and might want to grab a bite of you. Making a fire in the wild tends to protect you from the jungle's biggest predators. The fire scares them away, at the same time that it lets them know that this area is taken. So there. You made it through your first two days in the jungle all in one piece. Congrats! But the next morning, walking in the woods, you run into that wild cat that you were hearing the previous night. It's a jaguar. And its offspring. It starts hissing and showing you its teeth. Uh-oh. What should you do now, Indiana Jones? Your first option is jumping up and down in the same place, trying to scare it away. Your second option is to stand your ground and get as big as you can, also making hissing sounds to scare off that mama jaguar. Your third option is throwing sticks and stones at it, hoping it's enough to keep it away while you slowly walk away. Jumping up and down might make that mama jaguar more agitated and attack you instantly. Remember, mothers accompanied by their offspring tend to be more protective and reactive. Throwing sticks and stones might have the same effect as those jumping jacks, which is a no-go. Your best option would definitely be standing your ground and getting as big as you can. Much like Chris McEndless in Into the Wild, you come by a river that you need to get across. You need to assess the safest way to cross it. You can take off your shoes, together with most things that weigh you down, and swim straight across it. Or you can build a makeshift raft from nearby materials, like trunks of trees. You can toss a stick to evaluate the speed and strength of the stream, and try looking for a narrow section to wade through. Here's what you should never do. Swim across a fast-moving river in a straight line. You also should never attempt to cross it barefoot, as this cuts down the traction. Mm. Building a makeshift raft is probably not very doable in the wild, or it might take you days. Tossing a stick to check the current is an expert trick. It'll help you to evaluate if that river is safe to cross or not. Narrow and shallow areas are your go-to choice, if they're available. While hiking, you accidentally cut your hand on a sharp rock. There's no time to panic here. You need to act quick. What should you do? You should hurry to find the source of the bleeding and apply direct pressure to it. Or you should find a source of clean water, rinse it, and then cover it with a bandage. Or you should try searching for something to cover the cut, like leave something. The last option is totally out of the way. Don't cover it with anything without cleaning it first. You probably won't have the time to find a source of water while you're bleeding a bunch, which only leaves us one more option. You should find the source of the bleeding and apply pressure on it. You come across an animal's carcass in the wilderness. It appears to be fresh, but you're unsure of its origin. What should you consider before deciding to eat any part of it? Well, you should definitely look at the color of its fur or feathers and the lack of strong smell. You should watch out for the presence or absence of scavenger birds nearby. 
you should wait until you see another wild animal eating it. If there are scavenger birds hanging around like vultures, this means that the carcass is probably not safe for consumption. These birds have a pretty hyped-up sense of smell and are attracted to decaying flesh. But if they are avoiding the animal, then it might be an indication that it could be diseased or contaminated. In other words, your first option is your best option. It's been three days now, and you decide to signal for help. What took you so long? You have a few options here. You can yell and shout at regular intervals of time. You can blow your survival whistle in bursts of three. You can wait until it's nighttime again and put out your fire so you can send signals with smoke. What's your best pick here? Well, let's face it. You shouldn't waste your precious life force to yell from minute to minute. You should preserve your energy and your voice. Blowing the whistle can come in handy if you hear human sounds in the forest. Otherwise, it's also a waste of energy. Your best pick is probably to send smoke signals to the sky. Hopefully, the rescue team comes to rescue you. If not, well, that animal carcass is looking better and better now, isn't it? Ew. You're flying over the Pacific Ocean when suddenly a storm hits the plane, causing it to shake. The aircraft begins to descend and you lose control. You quickly put on a parachute, eject yourself from the plane, and land on an island. It's a good thing you were the only one on the plane transporting some goods overseas. Luckily enough, the storm hasn't damaged your parachute. You unstrap yourself and head to the closest shelter under some palm trees. You're waiting for the storm to be over. The next day. The sun is shining, and the waves seem nice and friendly. You wake up and look around. Nothing but a large stretch of water encircling you from all directions. Not a boat, human, or another living being is around. You scout the island, trying to find anything. You don't even know what you're looking for. On one side of the small island, you see some scrap metal and remnants of the plane washed ashore. You rush over there and try to see if there's anything useful. Too bad everything is destroyed. However, one sealed box has made it. You open it and see dozens of duct tape rolls piled on top of each other. After going through the island, you head back to your camp, dragging the box of duct tape. You try to figure out what to do. Soon, you get a light bulb moment. There are some places on the island that are hard to access, and since your shoes have been damaged, you fashion out some sandals. To do it, you grab some branches and try to use duct tape to make a new pair of shoes. After many failed attempts, you almost give up. But then, you attach some duct tape to pieces of tree bark that are roughly the size of your foot. Those are going to be the soles of your new shoes. The duct tape is smooth and won't hurt your feet. After adding several branches, you wrap the duct tape around your feet and voila! You have duct tape sandals. Now you can venture into the rocky parts of the island without damaging your feet. As you walk along the island, you start feeling the heat. You wrap your shirt around your head, but it's not enough to protect you. You use some duct tape to create a hat with the help of leaves. Then you place it on your head. You're now safe to go. After a while, you bring back some stuff you found around the island. By this time, you've started to feel that your tummy is rumbling. Next, at a rocky reef, you spot some large yummy crabs and fish, but you can't catch them with your bare hands. You grab a long branch, take some palm tree leaves, and tie everything together to make a net. You then use the duct tape to reinforce it and head to the reef. You're wearing your makeshift sandals and the hat to protect your head and carrying the net to catch some fish. So far, you've only used two rolls of duct tape. After a while, you manage to catch some fish and crabs and take them back to the camp. You make a fire and start grilling your catch. You're sitting on a log, 
but such a seat isn't too comfortable. You take some duct tape and make a mat for yourself. Once the food is ready, you feast on it. Now another problem, water. There's no fresh water around, but a storm is coming. Meanwhile, you take some coconuts and eat dessert while drinking coconut milk to freshen up. You prepare a small hut by gathering branches and leaves and duct taping them together so that water can't seep into your new home. At the same time, you create a funnel out of duct tape to collect rainwater. After getting into the funnel, the water is collected in a makeshift pond, also made out of duct tape. At this point, you've used almost half of the duct tape rolls. The storm starts brewing and you stay inside your hut where you have your new floor mat. You're bored, so you create a chair and table out of duct tape to make the hut a little comfier. It starts raining and you notice that some water has gathered in the reservoir you built. You immediately drink it using a coconut shell as a glass. Your hut manages to withstand the storm and you catch some Z's on your comfy mat. The next day, you check the duct tape supply and see that you are now halfway to finishing your last roll of tape. You've made a secured and solid hut and have a steady food supply from the reef. You've already spent five days on the island, so now it's time to find a way out. You've tried your best to seek help, but nothing. Not a plane or ship in sight. You're desperate to get out, and you're lucky. You spot a cargo ship very far off in the distance. You need to act quickly. After reviewing your box of duct tape, you decide to create a raft to sail away. You gather enough food and water for the journey and get to work. You start by collecting large logs for a base and setting them side by side. You have some rope made from tree bark and leaves to tie the logs together. It's big enough to fit you. You then get another set of logs and place them on top of the base and repeat the same process to create a second layer. This way, you minimize the risk of sinking. In the end, you duct tape all weak spots to reinforce your raft. You use some branches to create oars for rowing with paddles made out of duct tape. You see that you've used around 75% of your supply, including the tape you use to construct the hut and furniture. It's not as strong as fresh duct tape, but it still does the job. After the base and oars are finished, you create a small hut to shelter your food and supplies and protect them from waves. Also, you make a mast out of wood and use a piece of cloth as a sail. You put the raft on the water and begin rowing. So far so good. You open the sail and take a break from rowing. You turn around and take a look at the island that has been your home for the past five days. You're going on a dangerous journey, risking it all. But if you remain on the island for too long, then you definitely won't make it. It's been an hour already, and the island is barely visible. But the ship is getting closer. You still have one more roll of duct tape to use in emergency situations. The waters are calm, and you see dolphins swimming around. You snack on some fish and drink some water before noticing that the waves have gotten larger. You prepare your sail and duck for cover. It's a good thing your raft is sturdy. Large waves crash against it, knocking off some of your food and water. But the raft is still in one piece. As time passes, the sun begins to set and there's still no sign of life. You use the rest of the duct tape to repair the raft. Even though you lost some food during the storm, you have your net to catch more fish. You start a small and safe bonfire in a coconut shell, cook the fish, and start eating. You turn around and spot a ship coming your way. You immediately grab a branch, light it, and start waving it for the ship to see you. It looks like it will miss you. But then, someone on the ship notices you. They drop down an emergency boat to pick you up and rescue you. It's safe to say that duct tape has truly saved your life.
Ready for this? You will not be able to leave the confines of a bath of any type for an entire month. And you will be provided with food and drink that your friends will take turns to deliver. You'll be able to constantly adjust the water temperature whenever you like, so that the water won't get too cold. You're getting excited, and you're confident that you'll earn quite a bundle of cash, equating to several hundred dollars when you last the entire month. It's the bet you made with your friends only a short time ago from within your simple fishing village where you were sitting with your friends at a bar. Little did you know that it would lead to this from a simple conversation. You had been discussing the evolution of mankind, and the conversation mainly focused on the potential that humans could have moved towards evolving to water-based mammals, potentially becoming mer-people. The facts are all in evolution, you tried stating to your friends. Your friends weren't convinced, even with your example regarding getting wrinkly fingers from being in the water for too long, an evolutionary trait we humans adapted to ensure we have grip whilst fishing with our hands in water. Of course, your friends don't see how this could relate to the possible evolution towards becoming a mer person. You felt the need to prove them all wrong. As your friends sat around enjoying themselves, moving on from the conversation of aquatic evolution, you thought hard. How can I prove them wrong? Then it came to you. You stood up, finger pointing to the sky, and said, I bet I can stay in a bathtub for an entire month. And here you are now following the arrangements you seem to have doubts about. Knowing about particular human evolution reignites confidence and understanding in you that there have been some instances in human history where people have adapted naturally to live with their sea-based lives. So this feels like a safe bet. For example, the sea nomads in Southeast Asia have been fishing for 1,000 years in their unique way. Diving deep into the water to catch their fish armed with just a spear these sea nomads have adapted to grow larger over the centuries. It allowed more oxygen cells to be pumped through vital organs and more oxygen to be stored for their deep water dives. This understanding gives you confidence as you await the first day of the bet. During the first few hours, you seem fine. In fact, you find it to be easy and joke throughout the first day, bragging how this will be the easiest money you'd win and what you plan to buy with it all. You sleep well through the first night but little do you know that your skin absorbs the water in the bathtub as you sleep. With each passing hour, more water enters your skin. Between the two layers, water bubbles form, creating visible lumps on the outer layer of your skin. As you awake the following day, you're slightly alarmed to see the transformation of your skin. You look over your hands, they are all white with the skin crumbling away, and your arms are covered with large lumps of liquid. It's not a pretty sight. You hear someone coming into the bathroom, and you try to calm yourself down. It's only the first day, after all. You just need to toughen up. You need to win this bet, not only for the money, but also for argument's sake. Your friend enters the bathroom with a tray of food, and your friend's facial expression soon turns pale as they see the lumps on your arms. Concerned, they ask if you're okay, and surprisingly, you do feel just fine, and respond that you're just a bit itchy. You're pretty curious how there's no pain, given the sight of your arms. Without thinking, you begin to scratch the large bubbles on your arms. You continue to rub your arm to see the skin's reaction. You now have a freeing feeling as your arms are exposed, as though you have removed unnecessary weight. You find yourself with a new layer of scales in place of skin. Your friend requests that the bet must end, given the sudden change to your appearance. You argue that you're okay and that you want to continue. There's just too much at stake and you want to win this bet desperately. As your friend accepts this and leaves, you request an upgrade to a jacuzzi. You're soon upgraded to the jacuzzi and by now, not only do your friends come to visit you, but members of the village visit curiously, as events like this don't stay secret long in such a small, simple village. As days go by, more scales appear in place of your skin, covering your legs, arms, and your lower back. Your skin is still visible throughout most of your body, but the scales are spreading quickly, similar to a rash. It doesn't take long before you get tired of the jacuzzi and your friends are happy to support an upgrade to the village's swimming pool next to the seaside. You're now in the final week of the bet, and by now, the entire village knows about you, the merman. What you find to be incredible, though, is that as the people visit you in the pool, 
There's no fear or judgment. The people are just overjoyed and intrigued at the spectacle of it all. The pool is large, but it isn't heated. A teenager asks you whether you're warm enough, but you don't notice the cold at all and feel pretty comfortable. Your diet has now changed significantly. You prefer primarily fish. Webbing has grown between your fingers and toes, and small slits on both sides of your ribs have opened, forming gills to allow you to breathe underwater. As you continue to evolve, you keep trying to reassure yourself that it's just a little longer and that winning this bet was all that mattered. You think back to almost a month ago when you and your friends placed down your bets, thinking of the cash. Oh, several hundred dollars. It'll all be worth it soon. And besides, you could always devolve back to normal. This will only be temporary, surely. The final day of the bet finally arrives. A great party has been arranged to celebrate your victory. The entire village attends the celebration. There's a band and a great feast for all to eat. You enjoy yourself with the villagers, preferring to stay in the pool, of course. Teenagers throw fish to you, and you catch the fish in your mouth, laughing at your own expense. You jump into the air, performing tricks to the villagers who applaud with every trick. As the party goes on, you slowly break away from the celebration, watching on by yourself in your pool. You feel yourself growing tired of the festivities and the attention. You look on as the villagers laugh and party. You think you're somewhat out of place swimming alone within this simple village. You feel a sudden urge to leave, and you no longer care about the celebration. You have no interest in the money from the bet. You're not bothered that you proved everyone wrong. You only feel the desire to be free. You swim to the edge of the pool. It's dark, so no one can see your attempt to escape. As you pull yourself out, the weight of your body out of the water is so heavy, and your legs and arms are so weak that you collapse and have to crawl very slowly towards the beach. Eventually, you make it to the edge of the shallows, and you collapse as you make it to the water out of breath. The small saltwater waves you feel splashing on your face reinvigorate you after your exhausting journey. Once you've gathered enough energy, you begin to swim towards deeper water. And like a fish to water, you swim with ease. The feeling you have now, swimming in the sea, is like you had been in a cage all of your life. Now you're finally free. The exhilarating feeling of the water with unlimited space seems like heaven to you. As you swim further into the sea, you stop suddenly to look back at the village for just a moment. You pause and watch the town that was once all you knew and you listen to the muffled sounds in the distance, reflecting on the life you had within the village. You feel no emotions as you look back, with no regrets or remorse. And then you dive underwater, ready to begin your new life under the sea. You can turn ordinary matches into waterproof ones. Apply a thin coat of nail polish to the matches and let it dry. Once they're ready, they'll stay dry enough to start a fire, even if you drop the matches in the water. If you get lost somewhere during the winter and need a drink, then don't eat snow. It has much more air than water, so you won't even feel much more hydrated. Your body also wastes a lot of energy trying to eat it. Even worse, you might lower your body temperature and could even get sick. If you find yourself face-to-face -face with a coyote or a wolf, don't turn your back. Slowly retreat while facing the animal. This might only work for a single animal, though. If you meet a pack, then the most important thing is to make sure that they don't surround you. Back away towards a tree and press your back against it. Then choose the right moment and climb it as quickly as possible. Several layers of clothing will warm you better than one warm fur coat or down jacket. Air will be trapped between the clothing layers, insulating you and keeping your body warm. If you get lost in the woods, always try to sleep a little above the ground. You can lay on a layer of branches and leaves as a makeshift bed, or stretch a hammock out between some trees. At night, the temperature drops and the ground becomes cold. Even if you build a fire, it could go out while you sleep, and the ground will be sapping your body heat. You're in a boat in the middle of the sea, no food, no fishing net, and you're hungry. It was supposed to be only a 3-hour tour. Well, guess what? You can catch fish with the help of shoelaces and any object phone, watch, or keys. The shadow cast by the boat in the sea can attract fish, and a reflective object can work as bait. Tie your keys to your shoelaces and use them as a fishing rod. 
Even if a fish doesn't bite, activities like this are a good way to maintain a healthy mind on the open sea. A short meditation can save you from a panic attack. You need to focus on your breathing and try to slow it down. Your brain will quickly calm down and turn its focus away from the panic. Oxygen masks in airplanes work on the same principle. When you control your breathing, your attention is redirected away from whatever bad thing is happening. You can make a torch out of a log. Put a small log vertically, make a deep star-shaped cut on the top, put dry grass leaves and sticks inside. Once you're done, set fire to the log and watch it burn for up to 3 hours. This should work the same regardless of the size and type of wood. Now, if you meet an angry grizzly bear, never try to run away because the bear can easily outrun you. Instead, lie down and don't move. Grizzlies only usually attack when they see a threat, so they'll often leave you alone if you show them that you won't cause them any problems. This only works with grizzly bears, though. If a confrontation is unavoidable, back away slowly and use bear spray. If you don't have any, pepper spray will work similarly and should disorient the bear and scare it away. Or not. Don't eat berries or mushrooms in the forest if you don't know exactly what they are. They could be poisonous. If you have no other option, eat the inner bark of maples, birches, and pines to fill your stomach. Use a knife to cut away the rough outer bark and get to the softer white stuff. You can boil it to make it even softer, or cook it over an open fire to make a crunchy snack. And if you're really starving, you can look for ants. They might not be the most appetizing, but they're pretty nutritious. If you don't have a watch, you can use your fingers to find out how much time is left until sunset. Raise your hand so the inside of your palm is facing you. Your fingers should be between the sun and the horizon line. See how many fingers can fit in this space. The thickness of one finger equals about 15 minutes, so you can calculate the time left before sunset. If you're lost and need to build a fire to attract attention, throw in a lot of pine, cedar branches, cones, and any unnecessary rubber objects. Your fire will emit more black smoke, which makes it visible from afar. If you have no water in the desert but have some food, try to avoid eating for as long as you can. The more you eat, the more thirsty you'll get. The body needs liquid to digest food, so it'll use up what little you have. A person can live much longer without food than without water, so don't be afraid to stay hungry. Hey, you found a huge puddle of dirty water in the forest. If you're desperate for a drink, you can fill your bottle and filter it into drinking water. To clean it, make a rope of gauze or clothing. Put one end into the dirty bottle and the other one into the empty one. Before long, the clean water will flow into the empty bottle through the rope while the impurities are left behind. Before hiking, replace your regular shoelaces with paracord shoelaces. If you don't have enough rope, these laces can give you a few extra feet in a pinch. If you're lost in the forest and have nothing to warm you, then take dry leaves and grass from the ground and put it between two layers of clothing. This will help you stay warm for a long time. When you're lost in the desert, try to move as little as possible during the day. Find a shadow or create it from improvised materials and sit in the shade until dark. At night, you'll spend much less energy and use up less fluid while you walk. This will help you to avoid the risk of a heat stroke. If you fall through some ice, don't try to get out like you would in a pool. If you put your hands on the ice and try to push yourself out with your arms, it could crack and make you fall back into the water. You need to stretch your arms parallel to the ice surface and stretch your legs way back so they float in the water. In this horizontal position, start waving your legs as if you're swimming. Move your arms carefully without putting too much weight on the ice, and you should be able to escape. If you need to build a fire while it's too windy, here's what to do. Dig two holes next to each other and create a small underground tunnel between them. Make a fire in one of the pits. The wind can't extinguish it, and the fire gets its air through the second pit. This method is also useful if you need to build a fire without drawing attention. In the dark, this kind of fire won't be visible. Don't throw away or pop bubble wrap. Take it on a hike with you. It will protect you from the cold better than even a thick blanket would. 
those tiny air bubbles are perfect insulation. Just put it in between layers of clothing, and it'll stop any warmth from escaping. The plastic it's made of is also waterproof, so it can stop you from getting wet, too. Swimming in the sea not far from the shore, you can easily get swept up in rip currents. If this happens, the most important thing to remember is not to swim against the current. This will only waste your strength and sap your energy, and you're unlikely to ever overpower an ocean current. Instead, try to swim sideways along the shore. Sooner or later, you should get out of the current, and then you can safely swim to the beach. If you're stuck in a falling elevator, don't try to jump at the moment of collision. Don't take a sitting position or stand either. You need to lie on the floor, facing the ceiling. Spread your legs as wide as possible, cover your face with one hand, and put the other hand behind your head for protection. You reduce the pressure on your body in this position when you fall. Ooh, you're lost! A rescue helicopter flies over the forest, but you don't have a flare and don't have time to build a fire. Use a small mirror or phone screen to reflect the sunlight. Aim the light beam towards the helicopter. Rescuers should notice the glare and fly over to save you. Now, if you're falling from a great height, try to copy a skydiver's position. Your head and chest should face down. Spread your arms and legs and bend them at a 90-degree angle. If possible, choose a place to land. Bushes or haystacks can cushion your fall. Water surface is only safe if you fall from a height of no more than 150 feet. Before landing, try to position your body vertically. Remember that it's always better to fall forward than backward. Protect your head and neck with your arms locked together. Actually, none of this will save you, but it will give you something to do before they name the crater after you. Now, if you're plummeting from a cliff, do your best to break your fall down into several parts. The shorter they are, the better. Each of these parts will absorb some impact of the fall. This way you'll have much higher chances of surviving. Try to grab onto a sturdy object, like a bush or a rock on your way to the bottom. It'll slow you down. If you see a piece of wood or a plank, snatch it too. It might help to soften your fall when you hit the ground. Most importantly, don't hold your body stiff. This is likely to harm your internal organs. Cover your head and try to land on your feet with your knees slightly bent. In fact, once you hit, everything about you will be slightly bent. But hey, you gotta try! If a building you're in collapsed and you ended up under a pile of debris and rubble, try to keep your panic at bay. Yeah! Your main task now is to protect your breathing organs and make your air supply last as long as possible. If there's enough space, take off your shirt or t-shirt and tie its bottom in a knot. Then put it back on your head through the neck hole so that the knot is on top of your head. You'll get a makeshift hood that will protect your face from dust, sand, and debris. It will also provide you with a bit of oxygen while you're trying to get back to the surface. If you're stuck in a falling elevator, lie down on your back and try to occupy as much space as possible. Your body fat and muscles are compressible. They'll absorb some of the impact force. If you can't lie down, sit on the floor. It's still better than standing. Your backside will act like an airbag in a car. But whatever position you choose, cover your head. The best way to do it is to put one arm in front of your face and the other on the back of your neck. If you get stuck in the wilderness, first of all, find some water. Check low-lying areas. If there are mountains, look for water at the foot of the cliffs. If you manage to find some rainwater, Don't let it stay in the container too long, it may go bad. Pay attention to ants climbing trees. They're likely to be traveling toward a source of moisture inside a tree. A bottle of water can help you start a fire if you keep it under direct sunlight long enough. The bottle will act as a lens, gathering all the heat in one spot. Use fire and smoke to signal for help. Cover the flames with a big branch or with a pan for 3-4 to seconds. This will gather enough smoke. Then let this puff of smoke go. Now, if you've fallen through the ice, try to get back to its edge. Don't pull yourself out by grabbing it. The edge will keep breaking, and this will wear you down in no time. Kick your legs until your body is positioned horizontally in the water. After that, get out of the water and onto the ice. Once you've made it there, don't stand up. Your weight should be distributed over a larger area. 
then the ice will be less likely to break. Start rolling toward the shore like seals do. If you have a muscle cramp while swimming, try to turn on your back and float this way. Massage the bottom of your foot or the part of your leg that feels tight. If you have a cramp in the back of your leg, bend it at the knee and pull it toward your chest. You should be still floating on your back. Try to relieve the cramp by pulling your toes inward. If you get caught in an indoor fire, stay low and crawl toward the nearest exit. The smoke usually rises toward the ceiling. That's why crouching might keep you from inhaling it. If you have a piece of cloth or a handkerchief, put it against your mouth. It'll act like a filter against the smoke. Fall to the ground and roll back and forth if your clothes have caught fire. If you do have a fire extinguisher, aim it at the base of the flames. It's much more effective. And keep in mind that if you break a window, you'll let in more oxygen, and this will feed the fire. And here's what you should do to stay safe during a natural disaster. If you see the area getting flooded while you're outside, run away from any streams, storm drains, or rivers. Try to get to higher ground. If you're stuck at home, move to the roof if you think it's safe enough. If a tornado is moving towards you and you don't have time to escape, find a ditch or some low place. Lie down and cover your head with your hands or clothes. If a tornado happens while you're inside and there's no basement in your house, hide in a bathtub. Use a pillow to protect your head from any kind of debris that may fall down. The plumbing in the bathroom walls adds structural strength to the place. But if your bathroom has windows or an exterior-facing wall, pick a more secure place, for example, a closet. The more walls separate you from the tornado, the better. If you're outside during a storm and you suddenly feel your hair stand on end, it's your cue lightning is about to strike. Your skin might start tingling and you're likely to hear some clicking or buzzing sounds. Immediately crouch down and place your head between your knees. But even though you should be as low as possible, do not lie down. The only thing touching the ground should be the balls of your feet. Keep your heels together. This way, instead of running through your entire body, electricity is likely to go in one foot and out the other. You can also cover your ears with your hands to prevent hearing loss. If you're lost in the desert, travel during the early morning hours. This way, you'll be able to avoid most of the heat. If you see a hill or some other high ground, climb it and look around. You might spot some greenery, buildings, or a road. You won't have such an opportunity at night. Many desert animals also hunt after the sunset. And here's how you should act around wild animals. If a bull is charging at you, stand still until it comes close. Then throw a piece of clothing in the opposite direction. Bulls react to movements. And throwing a hat or a shirt away from you will distract the animal. It'll chase the moving object. If a shark is moving towards you, don't swim away in panic. You'll look like something the animal will want to eat. Wait until the shark gets closer and start hitting it with your fists. Aim at its eyes, nose, and gills. These are the only vulnerable areas on the animal's body. If you meet a pack of unfriendly dogs, distract them and move away quietly. If one of the dogs still lunges at you, place some object between yourself and the animal's jaws. Now, let's say you've accidentally disturbed a swarm of bees, and now they are coming after you. Run in a straight line as fast as possible until they stop chasing you. An even better alternative is to find some shelter. It can be your car, a house, or even a public bathroom and hide inside. Now, if you accidentally meet a bear, introduce yourself. No, wait. Actually, everything will depend on what species it is. If it's a larger brown bear, fall down and pretend you've passed away. Shouldn't be hard. But if it's a smaller black bear, which rarely attacks people, shouting and making yourself look bigger may help. You may also try to scare the bear away by pretending to lunge at it. If you encounter a snake, try to be as quiet as possible. If there's an opportunity to walk away, go for it. But if you can't avoid the reptile, raising your voice, banging two sticks together, or stomping your feet might make it retreat. Even though snakes don't have visible ears, they're sensitive to vibrations. And if all of these things happen to you on the same day, Call the Guinness people. I think you've set some records. Going to the beach in winter seems like a good plan. You can have a bonfire, build a sandcastle, search for shells, or swim in the ocean. 
the vibe might make you overlook the dangers ahead of you. Do you really think through the potential risks of paying a visit to the beach in the winter? The number one risk is waves. You might think it's okay to admire the view on the beach a few steps back from the ocean. Now let me introduce you to sneakers. Not the chocolate bar, sneaker, or with another name, sleeper waves. These are oversized coastal waves. They catch people off guard because they occur without warning or trace. These waves are particularly seen in Oregon, United States. People have been injured and at least 17 people have been swept up into the ocean since 2000. It got more media attention in 2011 when a memorial statue was built honoring the two teens faced with sneaker waves in Oregon. So, how come these waves are so dangerous? It's about their nature. They come out of the blue. With big waves, you see them coming or growing big. Plus, they form in the ocean and come towards the beach. These waves appear near the shore. It leaves less time for you to run to a safer spot. Okay, most of the time, they're not huge, as would be seen in apocalyptic movies. Yet, you can never know what nature holds. Maybe you remember this example from Mavericks. In 2010, a crowd was watching the surfing competition. Suddenly, two large waves struck the people on the beach. It broke the seawall and injured more than 10 people. Sneaker waves don't look particularly larger than other waves until they break and quickly reach the beach. They form in a period of 10 to 20 minutes in between soft and regular sized waves. They can surge more than 150 feet beyond the foam line. Then they reach the land with high power. Plus, they carry lots of sand and gravel with them. Sleeper waves are more commonly seen along steep coastlines compared to beaches with wider and softly sloped areas. People named these waves, not scientists. They observed what waves do. They washed up in a sneaky way. I mean, scientists didn't classify this phenomenon as a distinct sort of wave like they did with tsunamis or rogue waves. There's little scientific research made about them. Researchers say that sneaker waves form in offshore storms. These storms transfer the wind energy to the water surface. The waves carry this energy and then arrive at the beach during times of calm weather. The larger amount of energy they obtain compared to the regular waves that preceded them causes them to go higher up the coast. Imagine you go for a walk on the beach with your dog. The waves gently reach the beach. You play the throw and catch game. You don't know about sneaky waves, so you turn into an unwary beachgoer. What's the risk? Being washed into the water trapped against rocks. Since it's winter, you tend to wear heavier clothes. The sand that sneaker waves carry can quickly fill clothing and shoes, and that weighs you down. How can people enjoy the beach safely? First off, keep your distance if you're on the beach for storm watching, for instance. It might be mesmerizing to see how waves roll in over miles of ocean. The storms hit the shore, and you look at those extreme turbulent swells transform into strong 30-foot long waves. Finding a higher spot that sees the ocean and waves might be best. Be the eagle, not the crab. Did Confucius say that? The second tip is if you're determined to storm watch, never turn your back to the ocean. Yes, eyes on the water. Lastly, be mindful of which part of the beach you're walking on. Stay away from the logs because they hold water. The water increases their weight. In the worst case scenario, the ocean is powerful enough to roll the logs onto you. Let's assume you're hiking near the ocean. Use the designated trails because park authorities determine them as the safest roads possible. Going off route can sound charming, but it can be dangerous for you and harmful to the ecosystem in the surrounding area. Now that you know where to walk, you can keep your eyes open about the geological stuff. Like the rocks can be slippery, erosion can rip them off. Yeah, it's better to avoid walking near bases of cliffs and bluffs. You'll never know when a natural phenomenon will occur. It might sound a little extreme, but you may want to check the tsunami evacuation routes of the area you're visiting. Tsunamis are hard to predict, but tides aren't. Tide tables are available online. This natural phenomenon looks harmless, yet it can isolate rocks from headlands and the shore. 
you probably don't want to find yourself with soaked wet clothes in the ocean for no reason. Climbing up onto the logs might not be the best idea either. Sure, they look heavy and sturdy when you're climbing, but even the smallest wave can take you like a leaf flying in the air. Not just logs, but also jetties are tricky. Sudden waves can make you lose your balance, and you can collapse. Let's return to the scenario where you and your dog are walking on the beach. This time your pet sees shorebirds and chases them. Birds could be there for foraging or roosting. Your dog could interrupt their chill zone. They can lose their energy reserves. Can you bump into creatures hiding under the sand? Some sorts of creatures can be dangerous for you. Better not to poke someone's home. Take a look at this one. It's a horseshoe crab. This one looks scary, yeah, but it's safe as long as you don't step on its spines. So, it depends on the type of creature you see, but generally, it's okay to explore the sand with caution. Until now, we look at scenarios where you were on the beach when they caught up to sneaker waves. You could be in the water too. You could be surfing, just like the contestant in the Maverick surf competition, or swimming, if swimming is the new case. Consider these. The temperature is lower, the waves are crazier, and there are probably no lifeguards there watching you in the winter. Swimming with friends is a safe option. Bonus, it's more fun. You should choose your swimming location carefully. Are there dangerous rocky areas? Can you easily go out if there's some sort of emergency? Know your spot. For that, you should check the weather too. Planning has a key role in winter water safety. A quick weather forecast and sea conditions check would do. You can consider buying a tow float if you're an adventurous open water swimmer. It's a flotation device designed to increase the swimmer's visibility in the water. They are lightweight and have fluorescent colors. Alternatively, you can wear a brightly colored swimming cap. We can talk more about the gear. Wearing a wetsuit is wise, as well as wetsuit gloves and boots. You can put your phone in a waterproof pouch or bag. Staying warm is essential in the winter. Don't just jump into the water at once. This can result in cold water shock. It's vital to enter the water slowly. In that way, your body can get used to the temperature. Once you take all the necessary precautions, you can enjoy the beach and explore its offers. What sort of gems can you find on the beach? A mermaid's purse? Maybe. No, it's not the purse of Ariel from Disney's Little Mermaid. That's actually an egg case belonging to sharks and rays. It's made out of keratin, kind of similar to your hair and fingernails. These purses are the place where the embryo grows. The egg hatches and the cases are carried away with the water to the beach. If you want to find one, you can look at the area near the seaweed. Have fun while searching for it! Now, I'm ending this video with a quick joke that's suitable for the cold weather of winter. What did the ocean say to the beach? Nothing. It just waved. Ah, a purple sunset. You must have seen one of those at least once in your life. Normally, it's nothing ominous and has to do with the way light travels. The light that the sun produces is white. When it goes through a prism, you see light waves of different colors, from red and orange to blue, green, and indigo. Light normally travels in a straight line if there's no obstacle in its way. The shorter light waves, including blues and purples, are scattered easier when they meet with those obstacles, like molecules and aerosols in the atmosphere. Because the sun is low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise, its light has to pass through more molecules that scatter the violet and blue light. The colors that your eyes pick up, then, are yellow, orange, and red. But with the right conditions, you can see the gorgeous purple sky. Sometimes purple sky appears for much scarier reasons. It can be caused by hurricanes, wildfires, or dust storms. The concentration of vapor in the air increases, and the light scatters more than usual. Dust, a setting sun, and low cloud cover all contribute to this natural show, too. The sky turns orange and red at dusk if there's still enough light. Then it gives off pink hues, which mix up with a dark blue sky above. Now, do you remember what happens when you mix pink and blue? You get the color purple. Not every hurricane makes the sky turn purple, and trying to predict if it's going to happen is like trying to forecast a rainbow. 
Still, people reported several major hurricanes made the skies turn purple. Now, green skies might look just as spectacular as purple ones, but they actually also scream danger. They're usually there to tell you a thunderstorm, hailstorm, or a tornado is somewhere nearby. The unique color is a result of yellow sun rays getting mixed with the blue light coming from storm clouds. So you're enjoying a nice day by the ocean with a fresh breeze in your hair, when suddenly you notice the water starts retreating from the beach at a huge speed. This is a sign for you to start running as fast and far away from the beach as you can. This most likely means that a tsunami is on the way. A quick reaction maximizes your chances of survival. Now, if you notice the sea level is rising, but it doesn't seem too extreme, it could be another sign of an approaching tsunami. It happens in 40% of cases, and the incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The next one, way larger and more dangerous, usually follows in about 10 minutes. Another thing about tsunamis is that they like to arrive with some loud sounds. People describe them as thunder, the sound of a locomotive, a helicopter, or just a loud boom. Do you see a channel of choppy water on the beach? It's in your best interest to stay away from the water. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange break in the waves or an area with a different color than the rest of the water. Random bits of seaweed going in all directions is another rip current warning sign. If you happen to find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat, but don't try to go against the current. You'll only waste precious energy. Scream for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the current, swim diagonally to the shore. The next time you spot conically shaped clouds in the sky, remember it's a good time to start looking for some shelter. If it just stays like that, a severe storm is on the way. But if a cloud of that shape starts spinning around, it means it's about to transform into a tornado. If you have bees nearby, they can save you from big trouble one day. These hard-working little guys get more active than usual when they feel like a storm is on the way. They speed up to collect more nectar before it hits them. And once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it coming. Their secret is super-sensitive hairs on the back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. For centuries, people have noticed that animals act weirdly a couple of days before big seismic events. Dogs can't start barking. Cows halt their milk and toads, rats, and snakes leave their homes. It looks like animals can feel smaller initial shock waves that humans don't even notice. Scientists have tried to find some legit explanation for it and run endless tests and experiments. But so far, they're still on their way to explaining this mystery. Can you smell ozone in the air? When a thunderstorm is on the way, it's the most distinct and pungent smell you can pick up. An electrical charge of lightning sets it free from higher altitudes. The other, more pleasant smell of rain is petrichor. Rainwater wakes up molecules on plants, trees, concrete, and asphalt. Their aroma spreads all over the place. You can even feel that smell in your own mouth. All those positive ions in the air that a lightning bolt sets free gets mixed with ozone and your saliva. And that's how you get that bitter metallic taste. When lightning is about to strike, you might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your palms may begin to sweat, and then you can feel your hair stand on end. That's a clear call for action, and that action is to run for your life. Positive charges are going through your body, trying to reach toward the negatively charged part of the storm. Trust me, you don't want these charges to meet. If you see no shelter that you can reach fast, try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Drop down your umbrella and stay away from wire fences, metal pipes, rails, and other metallic objects. And don't lie flat on the ground, it's likely wet, which means it's a great conductor of electricity. If you suddenly notice crevices in the asphalt next to your house, it could be a sinkhole warning sign. Inspect your house on the inside. Does that door begin to jam? 
Or maybe there's a gap where the walls meet the ceiling. Uneven kitchen cabinets and drawers, slanted floors, stairs that begin to slope, water leaking after every rain, and displaced moldings are all signs that a sinkhole is about to open. To find out if it's definitely a sinkhole and how dangerous it is, you gotta consult with an engineering company. If you find a sinkhole that's already there, you gotta stay away from the sinkhole area. Fence or rope it off to make it less dangerous for others. You'll need professional help to fix it. Some volcanoes scream when they're about to erupt. Small earthquakes, which often happen before, produce a hum. It's mostly non-audible to human ears, but sometimes it reaches a frequency that lets you hear it as a strange rumbling or hissing sound coming from the ground. This noise is known as a harmonic tremor. With some volcanoes, it's the sound of magma bubbles vibrating when they're going through crevices in the crust of the Earth. But it's not always like this. If scientists manage to understand what exactly causes these volcanic screams, they could create a limited early warning system for volcanic eruptions. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If its level is quickly falling, even if it's raining, this might be a sign of a nearing landslide. And if you hear a faint rumbling noise or unusual sounds, like boulders knocking together, it could mean debris is on its way to you. It's a sign to head to safety immediately, like right now. You're up to your neck in cold water. There's ice all around you. You've got to get out! When you're swimming in freezing cold water, your body can get a bit of a shock. Your reflexes might make you want to gasp, but don't. Just do your best to keep your head above water. Throw off any heavy objects like boots, jackets, or backpacks. When you reach some ice, don't just try and jump out. It's not exactly a swimming pool. Try to get into a horizontal position and use your strong legs to swim onto the ice. Use your hands to pull you out. Once you're on the surface, roll away from the edge, then crawl, then walk. If you're venturing into the wild, you may want to get some stuff ready beforehand. Make your own fire starter at home. Heat up some water in a pan, put a Pyrex container in there, and melt some paraffin wax inside it. Then take an egg carton and put some dryer lint in each section. Fill them with paraffin, wait till it's all solid, and cut out each little section. Just one of these little guys will make starting a fire way easier. Dental floss can be super handy for surviving in the wild. You can use it as fishing line with a can tab as a hook. Or you can use it as a clothesline. Just stretch it between two trees. It looks kind of flimsy, but a single strand can hold up to 5 pounds. It's also quite flammable, so if you're having trouble starting a fire, you can use a few feet of floss to start it up. You can make a seriously strong rope using a simple plastic bottle if you have a good pair of scissors. Cut off the neck of the bottle so it looks like a tall and narrow cup. Then, start cutting it like some people peel an orange, round and round in a spiral. Try to keep it the same thickness the whole time. It'll be a lot longer and stronger than you're expecting. You can use it to tie sticks together to make a hut. Or you can wrap it around your backpack in case it rips or something. Sugar might be damaging for your teeth, but it's got a pretty sweet superpower. Just pour some on a piece of cloth and use it like a Band-Aid. Oh, delicious! Mosquitoes can be a real pain, and there are loads of them around. You can make your own DIY repellent to keep those little guys away. All you need is an orange, a lemon, or any other citrus fruit. They're full of essential oils that mosquitoes can't stand. Peel an orange and rub the peel directly on your skin. Just make sure to crumple it a bit beforehand to help those precious essential oils come out. Another good way to keep the mosquitoes at bay is to add a bit of orange peel to your campfire. That releases the essential oils into the air. You're getting hungry, but you don't have anything to start a fire with. Empty your pockets. There might be something in there that you can use as a makeshift fire starter. If you have a battery and a metal chewing gum wrapper, you're in business. Cut a thin strip of the wrapper, long enough to connect the two sides of the battery. The middle of the strip should be thinner than the ends. 
Grab some dry grass, twigs, or even some paper, whatever you're going to use to start your fire. The foil strip should ignite right away, so make sure you're ready. A human can go surprisingly long without food, but not water. Depends where you are, but a lot of the time, it might not be safe to drink. You can make a DIY water filter. Start with a fire. Boiling the water may not be enough, so as soon as those ashes are cool, grind them into a powder. Don't just use any ash you randomly found in the forest. It might have some melted plastic on it or something. Then, you need a plastic bottle. Cut off the bottom and poke a small hole in the cap. Turn it upside down, put about 3 inches of charcoal in, and pour the boiled water in nice and slowly. The drips are ready to drink. If you're getting bits of ash in the water, wrap a piece of clean cloth around the cap for some extra filtration. A char cloth can come in handy if you're lost in the wild. To make it, you're going to need a metal container with a cover. Put a piece of cloth inside it and put the container into a fire for a few minutes. The cloth should end up getting a bit black around the edges, but still be intact. A char cloth catches fire super fast even with an old-school flint. If you're ever hiking in an anaconda's backyard, listen up. Stay away from shallow rivers because these giant snakes love to hang out there. If an anaconda decides to give you a little squeeze, don't exhale. Every time you do, the snake's gonna squeeze you a little bit tighter. Anacondas do have a weak spot, though. They don't like their tail to be bitten. It's not exactly delicious, but it'll get the job done. Avalanches are pretty powerful, so remember these tips next time you're out on the slopes if things get a bit hairy. First off, cover your mouth, use a scarf or some other piece of cloth, and don't let the snow in. Keep one arm straight above your head, and don't forget to dig out a little pocket in front of your face. That'll let you breathe for about a half hour. Get rid of anything heavy you're carrying, even if it's expensive. But make sure you hold onto your backpack. It's an extra layer of protection. And grab onto a tree if you see any. To get back to the surface, move like you're swimming straight up. Snow's just water anyway. If you ever somehow get trapped in a sinking car, don't panic and don't try to open the door. The water pressure from the outside will be too strong You'll just waste valuable energy, and that door just won't open. The best way to escape is through the windows. Roll them down and swim away. If you're not a great swimmer, you can try to create your own makeshift flotation device, like a plastic bag with air trapped inside. Tie a knot in it and make sure it's tight. A plastic bottle would work great, but one probably won't be enough. You can also use a raincoat or a pair of those waterproof pants. You can even use an upside-down trash can. If you have some car trouble at night, out in the woods, for example, you need light to see what you're doing. All you need is a bottle of water or a jug, or even a pickle jar filled with water. Just strap it on a headlight, and voila! The water will spread the light so you can see better. Perfect for setting up an emergency tent or finding wood for a fire. Mason jars, those pickle ones, are really handy when it comes to storing matches. If you're camping in a forest, it's really important to hide those matches away, somewhere dry and safe. To make it even more convenient, make a strikeable lid. Cut off the strips on the side of your matchboxes and glue them to the lid of your mason jar. Before your next big outdoor adventure, make sure you're all stocked up on dark chocolate. Chocolate is probably the most delicious survival food but it's also one of the best. It's loaded with calories and helps keep your mood up. Plus, you don't need a fork, plate, or fire to prepare it. Last one for today, people. Still having trouble lighting that fire? Look no further than that bag of chips you secretly hid from your fellow campers. Corn-based chips are everywhere these days. And apart from tasting delicious and turning your fingers a weird color, they have one more trick up their sleeve. You can use them to start a fire. These kind of chips are flammable, so make a little mound of chips and keep that dry wood handy. They'll light in seconds.
Now, when you need help in public, don't ask a group of people. Instead, approach individuals. Because of something called the bystander's effect, the group of people may not help you. This social psychology theory states that people are less likely to help you when others are around them. They assume someone else from the group will run to your rescue. If you're driving in the city or another area with a grid-like design and think you're being followed, turn right or left four times. You'll end up at the same place you were before, and if the car behind you does too, you're probably being followed. Don't go home and try to lose them. If you're outdoors while a storm is approaching and your hair stands up, find shelter immediately. Static in your hair means positive charges are rising through your body, reaching toward the storm's negative charges. You're likely to be struck by lightning. If a shelter isn't available, squat low on the ground on the balls of your feet, put your hands on your knees and your head between them. Making yourself as small as possible will minimize the contact with the ground and the damage from the lightning. Always carry a small mirror with you while traveling in isolated areas. It'll come in handy if you get lost. If you're stranded in the desert and a plane flies overhead, point the mirror toward it to reflect the light. If you don't have a mirror, signal planes overhead by waving both your arms up and down. If you're stranded somewhere in your car, don't abandon it. It's more challenging for rescuers to spot you without your vehicle. Unlike what's shown on TV, when someone's about to drown, they won't wave or cry out. They'll have their head tilted back, submerged in water. They'll attempt to keep their mouth above the surface by using their arms. When you see someone looking like they're floating or bobbing, trying to get their head out of the water by trying to climb onto the surface of the water, they need help. If you can't swim and you've fallen in deep water, don't panic. Hold your breath and let yourself bob up to the surface. Keep your back and legs straight. Try performing little kicks to bring your body back to the surface. If you're trying to save someone who can't swim, never approach them directly. They'll likely bring you down in their panic. Sneak up on them from behind, slip your arm across their chest, and make sure their hands aren't facing you. If they grab you, they can pull you under. Try to swim below them, come back a bit further away, and try to help them again. If you come across a grizzly bear, it's not your day. Now, don't run and don't make eye contact. Slowly walk away if it isn't close to you. But if it's charging, stand still, you can't outrun it. Speak in a clear, monotone voice and don't scream. Now, prior to this, you might want to research to see if there are grizzly bears where you're traveling and take pepper or bear spray with you. If a bear is within 25 feet of you, then use the spray. If it attacks you, curl up in a ball and lie on the ground. Stay quiet, don't move or panic till it goes away. Now, if a polar bear is chasing, but it's far away, start dropping clothing items, a hat, scarf, or a shirt, and run away. Polar bears have short attention spans, and they may stop to sniff your clothing. This will give you time to head to safety. By the way, if both of these bear encounters happen to you, then please remind me not to go on vacation with you. Moving on. If someone is choking, but they're coughing, don't intervene. Coughing means air can get both in and out, and they've got a partial obstruction in their airway. By helping, you could cause a backflow of air which could either force out the hazard or dislodge the blockage and cause a full block. Just let them cough it out. Only help when they can't breathe or cough. When caught in a strong rip current, never swim against it. You'll tire yourself and it won't end well. Swim parallel to the shore fast, but stay calm and comfortable. Even if you get further out, you'll eventually escape the current and can head back to shore. Thumbs are the weakest part of someone's grip. If someone pulls you by the wrist, don't twist your arms in their hand. Try to push away, starting right where their thumbs are. Notify your state department if you're going abroad. In the US and some other Western countries, you can tell the Department of State that you're going overseas. In the event of a natural disaster or a political conflict, they'll know that you need to be evacuated. They'll also update you on things that happen in the country you're visiting to protect you from trouble. If you find yourself in a stampede of people, you're in trouble as soon as you fall. 
Don't curl up in a ball and wait for it to be over. This can cause more damage. Try to grab someone's leg as they run past you to help yourself up and keep going. Sometimes, camping trips end with people lost. If you're in such a situation and trying to walk out of the camping site, take burned coal or wood sticks with you. Use them to draw messages on trees, rocks, or logs. The markings will stay there for weeks, and it'll be easier for the rescue party to trace you. Always carry a needle in your first aid kit. If you're lost, you can make a compass with one. You first need to magnetize the needle by rubbing the eye against hair, fur, or silk around 100 times. Fill a container with water, place a leaf on the water surface, and rest your needle on the leaf. It should start pointing north to south. When calling emergency services, first tell them your exact location and then the problem. Even if you get cut off, they'll know where to send the police or an ambulance. If you have a fishy smell in your home, call a licensed electrician immediately. It can come from overheated plastic and electrical components that can cause an electrical fire. It might be from an outlet, a switch, an electrical breaker, or something else. Like the fish you're baking in the oven. If a snake bites you, there are a few ways to tell if it was venomous. You can ask. It probably won't tell you. Venomous snakes usually have multiple colors and cat-like pupils. Look at the bite area. If there are two deep puncture wounds, you were most likely attacked by a venomous snake. If the bite mark has tiny sharp teeth and a U-shape, it was probably non-venomous. Whatever the case, call emergency services and snap a picture of the snake if you can. Using your mouth to pull the venom out is even more dangerous. You've got more chances of getting poison than removing the toxin from your body. If you're traveling and exposed to freezing temperatures, you're at risk for frostbite. At first, a part of your body will become hard and pale. Then you'll experience aching, stinging, and numbness. To avoid frostbite, apply petroleum jelly on your nose, ears, and the tips of your fingers and toes. You uh, did remember to bring some, didn't you? This brings up a reminder. If you're shivering while in the cold, you're safe. Your body is trying to warm you up by contracting your muscles. But once you stop shivering, and if you grow tired and want to sleep, then find a warm place immediately. You're at risk for hypothermia. You'll need a warm compress on your chest, neck, or lower tummy. Never apply a warm compress to your hands or legs. The sudden temperature change could force cold blood back into your heart, lungs, or brain, causing your core body temperature to drop. If you're lost and you need to drink water from a stagnant source, always boil it to purify it. Untreated water has bacteria or other oils and chemicals that can be harmful to you. The exact temperature and time you need to boil the water depend on the altitude. To be on the safe side, try to boil the water for 3 minutes. When cooking oils start to boil, they'll smoke and then catch fire. If that happens, turn off the heat and don't remove the cooking pot. Cover it with a metal lid. Fire won't survive without an oxygen source. Use baking soda to extinguish small grease fires. You'll need a ton of it to do the job. And only use this tip when the fire is small. Never use water. It'll cause the oil to splash and spread the fire. You got all that? Good. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. 
Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping choya and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern US and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still, there's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern US. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. 
Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and 